For all my McCarthyan existentialists out there, today we are going to do a deep dive into the absurdity of Sartre. And we'll be connecting Sartre, Camus, Sisyphus, and other aspects of existentialism with Cornelius Sartre. And the core rebellion of Sartre is against the idea of in insignificance. He is a lucid, action-oriented character who projects himself through the novel, not like Harrogate, Harrogate or others who are walking with nations. Sutri is learning to exist in the absurd world that Cormac McCarthy has created for him. And this is very similar to Sisyphus and what we experience. And McCarthy's scientific or theological indifference creates a beautiful antagonist that haunts Sutri and most of Cormac McCarthy's characters throughout their work, throughout his work. The energy of McCarthy's novels are dreadful. And McCarthy's characters aren't incels. They are willing, voluntary, solitary wanderers. You could say in every McCarthy novel other than No Country for Old Men, it's about a protagonist that's a solitary wanderer. In The Orchard Keeper, we see Marion, Ombi, and John Wesley existing with the phenomenological trauma of a death of one of the characters they're all connected to. They all are these wanderers in outer dark. Rinthi and Cola wander. Lester Ballard, Lester Ballard in Child of God rejects the societal norms and desires for his own experience. In Blood Meridian, there is a band of wanderers and all the pretty horses. John Grady Cole is an absurd hero because of everything that happens with Alejandra and he has to give all that up. Billy Parham has that responsibility, this weird drive to save his uh, redeem the wolf, then redeem his family, then redeem his brother. Sheriff Bell in No Country for Old Men is on this absurd journey, I, you know, to uphold the stand, you know, the standards of the law that were of that were before Chigurh and that concept of evil manifests. And then obviously the road is very existential. We're literally in the consciousness of two characters in a very dark world, and they're carrying the fire. And what makes this existentialist rather than nihilist is that most of these characters are trying to find meaning. They are taking actionable steps to decipher and feel in reality. There are some characters in, McCarthy and, in McCarthy's novels that do tend on the more nihilistic side, but the main protagonists in almost all of his no novels do have that air of optimism within them. And I'm getting a lot of this information from Elijah Gu Guerra's paper, Nothingness is Not a Curse, published in the Cormac McCarthy Journal. Shout out, Elijah. And Albert Camus defined absurdity as, quote, the confrontation of the irrational world and the wild longing for clarity whose call echoes in the human heart. And the use of clarity is very important because that is the basis of a phenomenological or existential reality. Perceiving reality as accurately as possible, trying to move away all the societal norms or your own emotions and trying to, it's very Eastern. And Sartre takes a more dualistic approach. He says that existentialism is dualism, our aspirations toward God, but our mortality, the separation between mind, body, and nature. And McCarthy's very rational take, his very indifferent point of view in regards to nature and the universe, create an irrational world. As readers, we are used to certain tropes and certain outcomes. And Camus states that when you live with clarity in absurdity, three things happen. Revolt, freedom, and passion. And what three better words are can we use to describe a McCarthy protagonist? The Border Trilogy is about the you know a rebellion against the oncoming technological world and this yearning for freedom. And you know, there's a passion behind it, but it's all broken because the yeah, as Plato once said, those who search for freedom become the, mo become the most enslaved. And John Grady Cole and Billy Parham are trying to move out of their obscurity. Parham has to watch the ecological world around him collapse and these wolves die. John Grady Cole has no influence on his mother's ranch and can't do anything. So what do they do? They project themselves out into their reality. But an absurd, absurdist freedom is one that's more of a moral, to moral relative, moral relative, Mystic, excuse me, aspect because it throws away the duty to God and to society and all these different things, and it frees up an individual to live as one pleases and move toward death in their own manner. And to us in 2023, this is a very simple concept. We see every single goober at Wanderlust or on Instagram living the life of their dreams and doing what they want. But when we zip back to a time where these ideas weren't inundated in modern consciousness, these characters were unique. And McCarthy really embodies this existence. When Joyce the prostitute gets arrested and she comes back as a more hefty woman, he rejects this because this 
object, this transcendental signifier of his desire, is no longer potent. And then we see him start to spiral to the point where he demolishes the relationship between them. And speaking of the myth of Sisyphus, it, you know, Camus said that the only philosophical problem that we need to worry about is suicide. And Sutri, at some level, comes close to suicide multiple times throughout the novel. But it's very interesting that Sutri, as Frank Shelton, uh, Cormac McCarthy once said, something along these lines, that suicide requires commitment and Sutri can't commit to anything. We really see this when Sutri goes out on his nature experience. You know, when I read that, I see this as this mystical awakening. He's going out there and confronting these demons in his soul and everything that he's done. But when he gets out, nothing's really changed. It does start moving toward, it does start pushing us toward the clima the climatic moment at, of the novel. But Sutri takes his experience in nature as one that this is just another place that I don't belong at. Almost like him just like going to prison. It's just him versus nature. He's losing and then he leaves. He's not integrating and creating a spiritual ecology or elevated lifestyle through nature. And obviously going there in winter isn't, you know, a way to do that without shelter. And so Sutri and Syphysis are very similar. His passion for life, life, excuse me, his hatred of death, his scorning of the gods, his hatred of boredom are very similar. You know, those that's his sentence. That is his life. And this is the foundation of the absurd hero, a character who is moving toward nothing. And one of the more natural and healing elements of Sutri is the river, is the Tennessee River. But it's nasty. There's multiple passages of Sutri where McCarthy's talking about the trash and the problems that happen on the river. I can just imagine how nasty it is. He says, quote, Got gouts of sewage faintly working, gray clots of nameless waste, and yellow condoms rolling slowly out of the murk like some giant form of fluke or tapeworm. But no matter how nasty this river is and this riverboat community that he's living in, he still moves on. He still moves forward. He's still out there fishing his lines. He is, out of his whole friend group, the only one with meaningful employment, even if it's very meager self-employment. And Sutri says a fun line that rejects religion and promotes the absurd hero when he says, quote, he might have been a fisher of men in another time, but these fish seem task enough for him. It's a direct statement about his laziness, about his indifference toward reality. And on the other side of absurdity is Christianity. That's why a lot of people, when they reject um, Christianity and get out of like religious uh, religion, they always turn to absurdity. They, you know, Russian literature and Camus and all, all these people. I, I don't know if you've ever had that experience. Let me know. But that's how I got exposed to existentialism. I really wasn't that, re I was, I was never religious. I'm not shit. But everyone around me and my family and whatnot was. And so in middle school, when I rejected it hard, existentialism was the driving force. And I've met a lot of people, you know, to channel and in life who share a very similar story. The most overarching absurdist rejection by Sutri is the rejection of his family status and his family wealth. And here's a question I'd like to pose to you guys. This is something that's been debated in the community. Is Sutri really choosing this? Is Sutri choosing to reject this? Or is he genetically like this? You know, we are saying like, oh my God, he's living in the slums and he's choosing this life. But what if he is just not wired for aristocratic or a life like this? We could call it mental illness or like whatever is happening. But it may be faulty thinking to assume that Sutri is 100% compliant with his uh, impoverished reality. And speaking of the rejection of religion by young men, this is what Cormac McCarthy had to do. He went to Catholic school. He was a Catholic. His family was pretty religious, I would say, and to people of our generation, very religious. And McCarthy, through his um, study of science, sex, drugs, you know, he took LSD and plenty of experience with women from what it seems like, figured out a rejection of all this. And there's a scene where Sutri goes to the Catholic church where he went when he was younger. And when Sutri's in the church, he sees the church and the idols and the the stories of not of not stories of eternal life and rapture, but ones of decay and death. And this is very um, similar to Cormac McCarthy's theological takes um, through Gnosticism or whatever you want to kind of interpret his first five novels or, or so. Most of the time, that's one of the main messages that he's doing. Sutri remembers, quote, a thousand hours or more he spent in this sad chapel, so many Black Fridays in terror of his sins. And the Catholic Church and church in general is a place for people to live out their fantasies, to live out their confessional illusions and whatever problems and trauma that they are dealing with. You could say that it's very similar 
to a therapy center. And that's what Sutri sees this as. These mad, you know, in McCarthy novels, we see, you know, the classic Southern rapture baptisms happening in the river. And men who are Christians, according to Sutri, are, quote, filled with tales of sin and unrepentant deaths and visions of hell and stories of levitation and possession and dogma of Semitic damnation for the taking up of a pair of the paradise, end quote. And the funniest line, one of the, you know, Sutri is such a funny line and he's taking a nap in the church and the priest is like, this, the church is no place to take a nap. I don't know if you've ever been called in, uh, irreverent or whatever by, you know, someone in the church. But Sutri's reply is, it's not God's house. But it's interesting because what Sutri experiences, a little bit out of nature, but really at the end of the novel, is kind of one of these transcendent Catholic raptures and awakenings, a Satori, an instant awakening in uh, the East. But seemingly this awakening, this freedom that is created is not from something religious, but it's through the denial of his alcoholism, his love of prostitution, of his friends, and that he's going to leave this cursed city, this haunted place that you know built him up into this being that he is with these problems, and he's going to go out and achieve freedom somewhere else. I mean, or that's what we hope at least. And so now we, we've covered rebellion, freedom, and now let's talk about passion, you know, the three characteristics of absurdism. And Suchery is actually a very passionate individual. People, you know, the, who are into drugs, into who are alcoholics and experimenting with these things are displaying passion. Men who chase prostitutes and um, are, you know, just womanizer. They are displaying these bouts of passion. What does uh, happen? What happens time and time again? Sutri gets money, spends money, gets drunk, gets in trouble, and is in this constant cycle of pleasure and pain. An interesting note that Frank Shelton makes that I think is actually very good is that Sutri is not using alcohol to fuel the passions of his life, but to escape its absurdity. Wow. He says, quote, drinking and um, drinking and mindless fighting are attempts to blot out consciousness, which in its ultimate form could be accomplished only by death itself, end quote. And one more quote, his search for both heightened reality and escape from reality is yet another indication of the ambiguity and certainty in which he lives. Another note is with Wanda, when he goes up to fish for the pearls and all that, I'm pretty sure that Sutri was hip that this was a scam. He thought maybe he'd make a little bit more money than he did, but why was he really going up there? Why, you know, go on this fruit, you know, this endless pursuit seemingly to experience something more? I would say that he was interested in the young girl for a very long time. And, you know, that that's also shown by him and the um, the dad going out and partying with the prostitutes and spending all the money and not bringing food back for the family. He sees these escapades as, as very hedonistic, no matter what he is doing. And... There are breaks, though, in consciousness, for instance, like when Wanda and them die. In an earlier Sutri draft, she's pregnant um, and she dies and with Sutri's baby and he rows off and like doesn't say anything. Um, also, with the first wife and the death of his child and him weeping at the end of that whole, you know, kind of traumatic experience, he is in the moment. He isn't, once again, a nihilist. He is taking this all in, but he's doing the best he can to kind of reject it. And that's kind of one of the tenets of existentialist men. And that's why I'm not an existentialist anymore. And I kind of moved on from that because you shoulder a lot of trauma. Like everything you think you, that you're pushing away is something that you're going to have to resolve later. It's It builds up, it builds up an ego and it creates a lot of problems. And that's why a lot of existentialists and absurdists are not that happy of people in my opinion the guys that i know and women that are into that are on in on the happiness scale not at the top which you would think that people that reject the norms and are hedonistic would be you know that would be a, the best lifestyle possible and there's also a commentary in terms of the concept of communal support because existentialist psychology which was very big in the you know um the mid 20th century was saying that the group is what hurt us in the first place like group therapy and a therapy at some level in general these communal tactics and ideas are not effective we need to heal on our own we need to heal through individuation and our own personal journey and mccarthy's family his his wife his various lovers all of his friends his favorite places his home are not enough to support him to solve these problems. So he has to set out at the very end as the solo absurdist hero. And all he goes with is, quote, the simple human heart within him. And so I, I wouldn't say that McCarthy set out to write an absurdist piece of literature. McCarthy is not, he's not an existentialist writer. He seemingly just kind of, a lot of his work just kind of fits into that category, as a lot of it fits into spiritual ecology and phenomenology and like a wide variety of things. That's why McCarthy 
um, studies is such a fun field. So I would like to know what you guys thought of this analysis. If you guys would like to add anything, we're talking about Sutri today. We could do, um, if you guys like this, let me know. We can do, I can do an analysis of every McCarthy novel from an uh, existentialist point of view. So like this video and I'll see you guys in the next one. Peace.